This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everybody to this week's edition of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me as always to break down all things in the world of Detroit sports, my guy Adam, the Jock Strozinski. What's up cuz? What's happening? I'm excited to record this week's podcast. So much to break down with the combine. The NFL world is going crazy with quarterbacks. I'm so fascinated to see how the Lions draft is going to shake out because Aiden Hutchinson might not even be there anymore at number two. So much to get into. I'm so excited. I literally caught more of the combine this year than I ever did. And I felt like I was in the know a little bit. I'm like, oh, I know that guy. I know that guy. I've I've had people write about that guy. So I was so excited. This was the best combine I thought ever. I think they should always do it from four until 11. Primetime was perfect. Yeah, it was nice watching in primetime. I want to know how you're feeling right now because – Right around, I think it was like 2.30, you sent me a, a picture of you indulging in some margaritas, and you're like, look, the the podcast is going to be a little bit lit today. I might be a little bit lit today. So I want to know how you're feeling right now. I'm assuming pretty good after your, it was a three margaritas you put down? I'm a traditional one drinker at a time kind of person. One Corona, one beer, one, uh, you know, tequila. But they had this thing, you know, I've seen people do, you know, this thing where they call it, you know, boats, where they have like five, six drinks and you sample a bunch, where El Charo had a sample of margaritas. I'm like, that sounds good. And uh it was funny. I was in the know. I'm like, I want the blue one. I think that's the carousel one, right? And she's like, yeah. And I said, I want one strawberry and one traditional. And boy, did they hit perfectly with the salt and the lime. The whoever, it, they, they appeared to be probably the pre-made kind. But, oh, my God, it was luscious. It was perfect for a Wednesday. They hit the spot with the shrimp fajitas, and, yeah, I'm feeling good. I always feel good. But, yeah, it it relaxed me. I I had the opportunity to have a meal with the missus, and I got home right at the right time to watch Kareem Benzema light up PSG to advance to the Champions League quarterfinals. They were down, actually. They would have been eliminated if Real Madrid did not score three goals. All of a sudden, Kareem Benzema lit up in the second half. I was so excited. I got to sit here and watch. And then all of a sudden, the Lions news broke with some signings they made. So it's been a great Wednesday. I'm so looking forward to tomorrow is my birthday, a little bit of time off from the practice. And I can sit back and relax and watch a bunch of television, catch up on the DVR. And oh, man, because how did you enjoy the combine? I thought the combine was sweet. I thought it was epic. I thought it was it really went by really fast, and I really don't regret at all my decision to stay home. I sat at home, and I felt like I got in the know because I got to sit in my sweet, new, luscious office and take in all the information from everybody there. There's so many great reporters that give all the information that you can surmise everything that's going on. And then plus the TV coverage, oh, my God, I got to see early in the morning Brad Holmes talk, so it got me an article and content there. I loved it, and there was drama with people's hand size, arm length. There was drama galore. It was perfect. It was awesome. Top to bottom, I loved everything about it. Look, you already know I'm a huge fan of the Underwear Olympics. The Combine is one of my favorite events that surround the NFL. It basically goes draft day and then Combine and then whatever the Lions do for the regular season because we can't even talk about playoffs. But I love the Combine. I thought this year was fantastic. I thought they did a great job presenting it. I thought they did a great job basically laying it all out. Uh, I thought it was weird this year. I, I didn't realize that that special team special teamers like punters and kickers were going to be competing in the combine, and it was interesting to watch a punter run a forty yard dash. At no point in the history of the NFL do I think that will ever play a role in whether or not you draft a punter or a kicker. But still, they went out there and they participated. I thought it was interesting. I thought it was fun. I loved it. I think watching this combine take place, I think we have some risers. We have some fallers. I think some of the guys here locally from Michigan and Michigan State, I thought they went out and they showed really, really well. I thought others could have did a lot better. I think the big name that's on everybody's uh, tip of their tongue is Aiden Hutchinson. And in my estimation, I'll be honest with you, 
I think he hurt himself a little bit with his combine performance. I don't think he tested as well as some of the other guys tested. And I don't know what that's going to necessarily mean for him if he's going to tumble down draft boards. I don't think he performed that poorly. I just was expecting a little bit more. And he didn't he didn't meet or exceed my expectations. I think when it really comes down to it, you watch the game film and you figure out if he fits what you want to do defensively, and then you go and you draft him if he's going to fit what you want to do defensively. But I do think his overall performance, if you look at everything he put on tape during the during the combine, I think it kind of hurt him a little bit. Now, I think everything he put on tape as far as the regular season goes in the Big Ten and what he – in the 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 – he had the, the, the Big Ten championship game and then what he did in the college football semifinal. I think those things kind of help elevate him and they kind of offset each other a little bit. But I, I myself was a little bit disappointed in what I seen out of Aiden Hutchinson. Okay. What did I you wanna, make of his performance? Yeah, I think you and I are seeing it the same way at the end result, but we're coming about it differently. I thought Aiden Hutchinson displayed elite athleticism, stuff that compared to one of the all-time greats in Jared Allen with Minnesota. His numbers are almost identical. But what you're saying, which is also very true, is that the others tested to be freakishly athletic, longer in their arms, and a little bit faster, a little bit bigger, and it begs the question – why would you turn around and draft Aiden Hutchinson just because he works hard? Try hard guys that are elite are fine, but try hard guys that are elite that have possessed more talent to start with is a lot better. So you look at it and you would say, just sit back and say, based on history, wouldn't you surmise that a player from the SEC who goes up against Alabama and their offensive line every year, who plays week in and week out in the SEC, the Southeastern Conference, wouldn't the likes of a Jordan Davis, wouldn't the likes of a Walker do much better for the Detroit Lions and have maybe a little bit less risk than Aiden Hutchinson? Something has happened over the last 24 hours that may be in disguise something that is way better for the Lions. There has been buzz for some reason that Aiden Hutchinson could move up to number one which would make the Lions' decision a little bit easier, but I think they would potentially look to edge Trayvon Walker, uh, Jordan Davis, maybe even Kayvon Thibodeau. But I think that – Trayvon Walker was my guy who yeah, really stood out. Dude, like, he stood out. I was out. so impressed with him. Absolutely. he made. I, I put him in a mock draft right away the next day. I yeah. said, okay, that's my guy. And I said to myself, look, and I'm not being biased here. I'm just saying that potentially there are better fits – for the Detroit Lions than Aiden Hutchinson, and I think the risk is a little bit higher. If you take an SEC guy, I think you sell that to the fan base more than Aiden Hutchinson, who many will say, oh my gosh, this is just a ploy to sell tickets to a fan base that's just desperate. I, I, I don't know if Aiden Hutchinson and his short arms can, can, can maintain coverage and maintain leverage against some elite offensive lineman. I think that question has to be asked and seriously looked at. Now, I don't, I don't think Aiden Hutchinson's going to have a bad career. I just think the others might project higher. And what do you make of this, though? There was a conspiracy theory, and I know you love a conspiracy theory. I love them. Do you think in any way, shape, or form that Thibodeau just bounced and has been acting this way so that teams two, three, four maybe will – will consider him a head case, and he can go maybe 9 through 15, which will inevitably be a better football team. That sounds wild, but why would he tell everybody, yeah, I'm going to work out, yeah, I'm going to do everything, run the 40 and then bounce? That's a weird flex move, and I don't know if it's something where he, if he's trying to do something to upset teams or if he's like, I don't care. I'm just, I mean, to come out and say, you know what he said? He said, well, it was kind of a long day, and he just bounced. Yeah. That's a weird unusual way to present yourself and then uh, the juxtapose that with him saying oh I work hard and this narrative that I'm not a, a try hard guy or that I don't give effort it, it, it lends to me like I'm not down for Kayvon Thibodeau I think the risk is higher too but I think that's kind of playing into what he wants if that's the case that's that's a really ingenious move on his behalf yeah, right? because I, right. as I'm watching the combine and I'm, I'm getting ready to watch this guy I'm like I want right. to see what all the hype's about 
And I want to see how he compares to a guy like Aiden Hutchinson. I want to see how he compares to a guy like Trayvon Walker, who blew my socks off. And what I got was, yeah, I'm not doing this. And he looked like he just checked out of the entire thing to to go through and tell everybody, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and to then just bail. <laughs> and, and his reasoning was, I'm going to do the DN stuff and I want to do the linebacker drills, but it's a really long day and it's everything's a little bit too spaced out for me. Like, wait, what? Like, I don't know if you know this, like, the football, like, if, like game day is a long day. Like, you know this, just covering the team is oh, a long oh, day. Oh Let's God. not even talk about, like, going out there and competing on the field. Getting prepared for a football game, it's a long week. So you think it's a long day? It, like, he rubbed me the wrong way. And instantly, I checked out on him. I was like, are you serious? Like, oh, now things can go on. You can have interviews. And maybe he, maybe he's very charismatic in the interviews. And maybe he... He screams football as his passion, but what I got at the combine, dude, total red flag, total red flag with with Kayvon Thibodeau, and I was just, I was, I was blown away. I was shocked. You come out and you say you're going to do something, just go do it. Who cares if it's a long day? All this guy did was the bench press, and all he did was run a forty, and that was all you got. It, it blew me away, and yeah, he might fall. Like I can see him falling. For me, the, 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 like the defensive end, the guy who seems like he's, he projects to be next level. Like I said, Trayvon Walker looked amazing. And there was a lot of talk about him going into the combine about how his lower half isn't, isn't great, doesn't have good bend, isn't a really fluid guy. Everything I seen, this guy tested through the roof. This guy is huge. This guy is impactful. He is fast he can get to the quarterback he is long he is everything that you want a defensive end to be he looked so damn good it made me really think about Aiden Hutchinson and you're right Aiden Hutchinson compares to one of the greats as a Lions fan you know Jared Allen terrorized you absolutely terrorized you and frustrated you Jared Allen was was Absolutely fantastic. And I think at some point, me and you had the conversation, like, why couldn't we ever get a Jared Allen? Well, here's your chance. You could, you could possibly get Jared Allen. You get the guy who tests as, as equal to him and sometimes better. But what I'm telling you is Trayvon Walker put on a clinic and really made me think twice about drafting Aiden Hutchinson and really made me think twice about a guy who was projected to go somewhere in the mid-teens to, to 20s and elevate him up to being a top three overall pick. So the, the the combine, like I said, really helps some guys, and I think it might have hurt a local guy in Aiden Hutchinson. All right, did you develop any uh, draft crushes besides Jordan Davis, Trayvon Walker? I thought it was interesting that Desmond Ritter and Malik Willis kind of emerged a little bit from the quarterback class. I wasn't impressed with Howell too much. Wasn't impressed with Kenny Pickett. I know he can throw the ball. He can sling it. But I just think he's he, he's not going to last past Pittsburgh, and his hands are just ridiculously small. <laughs> I mean, smaller than Jared Goff's. Yeah. And people are like, "What's the big deal? What's the problem?" Well, here's the problem, and this is the way the world is these days. He fumbled the damn football 26 times. Does that not uh, elicit any kind of reaction? Well, what's the big deal? That doesn't mean anything. Uh, 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 okay. Does the fact that he has shorter hands maybe indicate that he might fumble more? That is the the way this world is looking at is that when you tell people, guys, NFL scouts talk amongst themselves. They indicate that they would like the arm length of the standard defensive end or edge rusher to be 33 inches. If you just go to SI All Lions, we have a scout that we talk to, and he says there will be question marks that arise because Aiden Hutchinson has sub 33 inch arms. Now, will that preclude him from getting drafted? No. But will that be something that is talked about that may take uh, his name off of certain people's boards? Maybe, but he's projected to go in the top three. So when you, when you go, oh, I got to dismiss it. You can't dismiss it. The NFL evaluators are telling you there are things that we look at, and arm length is a significant thing. So you can't just pick and choose whatever you want to suit your own narrative, okay? It's great. 
I understand. I definitely understand the concept of don't let facts get in the way of a good story or don't let facts get in the way of your fandom. But you got to be careful when you invest the number two pick. You need a guy to hit. You can't fuck this up. You cannot. You have to get a player that will show up on that field and rush the passer. And we need him to do it like now, like yesterday. So I'm more confident in SEC talent to perform week in, week out than I am Big Ten talent. And that's just the way it is based on history. Now, of course, Aiden Hutchinson could go to Jacksonville, dominate, do his thing. He could go to the Lions, have a good career. But I'm tired of the tryhard guys. Moral victories don't mean shit to me. I want a destroyer. I want a guy to blow up right tackles on a consistent basis. That's what my eyes want to see. And right now I doubt Aiden Hutchinson. So that, it's up to him to prove me wrong, and I hope he does. But uh, right now I thought the combine and his measurement hurt him a little bit. I think that he isn't a freakishly athletic individual, but I, I just am I'm rooting for the Jaguars. Tony Khan, listen to this podcast. Uh, tune away from the wrestling one for a minute and listen to this one. Take Aiden Hutchinson. He'll put some butts in seats and he'll do something. <laughs> he'll be a tryhard guy. He'll do something for you. I don't know. Any draft crushes you developed outside of uh, me and the SEC? So I've got a couple. And, look, I already talked about Trayvon Walker. He's probably the guy who I'm crushing on the hardest. But I've got a couple of cornerbacks, and I've got a couple of wide receivers that I'm a little bit high on. So we'll start with the cornerbacks. And Tyreek Woodland out of Texas San Antonio. This guy is tall. He is quick. He's got long arms. Again, arm length matters. He's got long arms. He's got average size hands. I say when I say average, I mean like <laughs> over nine inch hands. So he's got some big mitts. This guy is so fast. Ran a four two six forty and can jump out of a gym. He had a forty two inch vertical jump. Now this is a guy who's from a, a smaller school. Uh, went to the Senior Bowl, and it really seems like some of the the Detroit coaches who coached him at the Senior Bowl really liked what he put on on the field and likes what he put on tape. So I think that'll be an interesting selection. This might be a guy that they could get a little bit later in the draft and might be able to steal. But with that 40 speed, man, that is some recovery. So if he gets beat, this guy can recover quickly and get back to make a play or possibly break something up. So really impressed with him. Sauce Gardner. The, the cornerback oh, yeah. out of, uh, out of Cincinnati, local kid from Detroit, another one who's long, 6'3", 190 pounds. Usually, when you talk about corners, corners are normally 5'10". They're like, they're taller, they're like an inch taller than me. They're not very big. These guys are 6'4", 6'3", uh, again, long arms, 33 inch arms. He's got over nine and a half inch hands. So again, big mitts and another speedster ran a 441, 40. That's quick, man. These sub 4440s are incredible. It's awesome. This is a guy who really didn't allow, he didn't allow any touchdowns this year. Like, think about that. His tape this year for Cincinnati, unreal. Absolutely stupendous. So, two cornerbacks I fell in love with. I don't know if either one of them will be there when Detroit is looking to grab uh, a guy with their second pick in the first round. But really like them. As far as wide receivers go, if you read the All Lines SI article, uh, I told you I fell in love with Jalen Torbert out of South Alabama. Again, had a really good uh, performance at the Senior Bowl. Ran fast, 449 uh, for his 40. Again, tall guy, 6'1", 194, long arms, 30, over 32-inch length in arms and big hands, 10-inch hands, can jump out of a gym. Uh, again, this guy... Looks like he is, he might be a project. I don't know how, how smooth he is. I didn't watch enough game film on him. I say game film with finger quotes. I just know what I seen from the senior bowl and I know what I seen from the combine. Looks like he projects to be a very good wide receiver at the next level. Also one more guy, George Pickens out of Georgia, another speedster, four, four, seven, forty, uh, vertical jump, 33 inches. Uh, this is another guy, 6'3", 195 pounds, over 32-inch length arms. Uh, hand size, not as big, eight and three quarters. Uh, but this is another guy who can jump out of a gym and do some damage. So, look, I think what you, what you're seeing with a lot of the prospects from this year's combine 
Speed is definitely there. This was an extremely fast class. All of these guys can run. All of these guys can jump. It comes down to some of the intangibles, right? Hand size, arm length, what their what their mental capacity is, what their mindset is, and what they can bring that helps separate them from the rest of the pack. But those are four guys uh, on top of Trayvon Walker that I was crushing hard on at the Combine. Yeah, it was awesome, man. A lot of good things were uh, occurring. The speed at wide receiver, I think, took a lot of people crazy. by surprise. Right. right. It was crazy for a second there where people were like, Bre- records are breaking, and you're like, oh, my gosh. But I think the good news out of that for the Lions is they can potentially get someone a little bit lower down the, down the road at 32, 34, mm-hmm. or maybe even later rounds with some depth uh, at well, that position. Look, I think it's an incredibly deep draft for – Yes. Cornerbacks, wide yes. receivers, yes. like those are positions of need for this team, and this is an incredibly deep draft for you to be able to go and get those guys. All right, put your name, put your nuts on the table, brother. Aiden Hutchinson goes one. Who is the Lions pick? Who would they select if the decision is made for him and Hutchinson's off the board? Hutchinson's gone. I think after the combine performance, I, I'm taking Trayvon Walker. Hell I was so impressed. Yeah. So Hell impressed. Yeah. And Hell look, yeah. I think just physically, physically, he is dominant. This is a guy who is, he's massive. He's, he's got 35 inch arms. Like, <laughs> like right. that is like, <laughs> like, I don't think people understand what that means for an edge rusher, right? Okay. So, I wanna, I, 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 yeah. What does it mean? Tell us. What does it mean? So, so if you put him on the edge and he's got arms that long, that means that the offensive the offensive tackle can't grab him, can't get his hands up underneath his pads and push him and direct him which way to go. Because his arm length is so long, he can put his arm out and basically push the tackle back into the quarterback before ever getting touched. And then all it takes is a swim move, and he's behind him, and then he's sacking the quarterback. On top of it, this is a guy who played outside and played inside. You remember when we had a, a, a defensive – lineman who played outside and play inside his name was Indomitian Sue if I remember correctly he was pretty freaking good a little bit of a head case but he was pretty freaking good also Aaron Donald plays outside plays inside this is a guy who's of that prototype play him outside play him inside he can walk the offensive tackle walk the offensive guard back into the quarterback and then get there and get the sack the funniest moment for me in the combine was my wife is not somebody that likes to sit there uh, hour upon hour of me watching it. But all of a sudden she saw Jermaine Johnson out of Florida State. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's a guy that potentially is freakishly athletic. He did a lot of things at the combine. She saw him run and she goes, holy shit. She goes, why should you get that guy? And I said, <laughs> yes, right? And she's like, God, he's huge. He's fast. She's like. Screw Aiden Hutchinson. Get this guy. And I'm like, right, right on, girl. Exactly. You know, I was like, I'm so That's proud. That's cool of that she watched it with you. Alyssa watched it with me. And, and same deal. She was like watching these guys just kind of run the drills and, and go through the motion, go through the steps. And there were certain people she was blown away with. Trayvon Walker was one of those guys for her as well. And, and then and before we switch topics here real quick to um, the, the, the freakish shit that went on all week with the quarterbacks, all of a sudden the highlight – of the combine there's a dude named jordan davis and guys you cannot understate what the man did the man is three bills plus 300 pounds plus gets up there and starts flying into the combine and you're like whoa this guy just ran a sub five 40 yard dash only like one of a handful like of a half a dozen uh uh linemen defensive linemen that have done that and you're like, what the heck just go is going on? Everybody just was like freakishly blown away by what he did. And then they started comparing him to, to what he did and the comparisons to the quarterbacks that were shocking. 341 ran a 478. That's almost on par with some of the quarterbacks in the league. And you're like, what? The hell, officially, his combine 40 was faster than Patrick Mahomes. Yep. How in the hell? It's crazy. Did, that's crazy, man. It, Almost it, 400 it, pounds. You <laughs> pick them up, put them down. The memes that were generated from it, the uh, dude, everyone was just like, dude, I'm scared. If that guy comes, I, I, I'm scared. Because the guy runs a 478 as a 340-pound dude 
was awesome to see, and it generated buzz. And we'll see how it shakes out for Jordan Davis. But, boy, I think him and the wide receivers in their speed did a lot of good things for themselves in raising up their draft stock. My goodness. So, cuz, we blinked, and all hell broke loose this week with the NFL. All hell broke loose. Aaron Rodgers is staying. Russell Wilson gets traded from Seattle to the Denver Broncos. And then on Wednesday, everyone was really clowning on the Washington Commanders because they tried to get Stafford, tried to get Russ. Their consolation prize is Carson Wentz? Huh? I'm like... For one of the rare times we look and we go, uh, I'd rather be a Lions fan at the moment. You go out and you trade for Carson Wentz, who the Colts and the guy that was his former offensive coordinator turned head coach of the Colts brought him there and still had to eat it. And you need one game to win and Carson Wentz doesn't get the job done in, in Jacksonville. And there's an athletic article, if anyone's a subscriber, there's a detailed article that basically just shits all over Carson Wentz. Mm -hmm. It's like literally a 2,000 word article that's like here's what happened. The owner didn't want him. The coach didn't want him anymore. He wasn't a leader. He refused to get coached and it was like Jesus. It's like let's feed all. Let's feed the athletic all the shit after he's out the door. My God. Well it sounds like everybody checked out on him halfway through the season. Yeah exactly And, and it was crazy because you know, maybe if you don't show the quarterback love, maybe when you need him, he's not going to want to show up. Yeah. I mean, the quarterback's not stupid. You know, he, he doesn't care. He's got big fat money. He's already got a ring. So if you're not showing him love, that shit plays on, on, on people. And that can be something that's very serious and, and eh, whatever for Washington, good luck. But it really hit home because of just what the Seattle Seahawks did. Now, I get it. I respect the people that messaged us at Detroit Podcast. Russell's younger. He had won a Super Bowl already. Stafford was unproven. But you can't help but look at going, damn, two firsts, two seconds, three players, including Noah Fant, and the opportunity to move on from Russell Wilson netted a haul of all ages. And I think Seattle landed one of the great trades. And I think they're going to eventually be happy because – my God, Denver, that division is stacked. I mean, you got to go up against Mahomes and Herbert and all that shit. Are you kidding me right now? That is going to be a division of all divisions out there for the Denver Broncos. Get out of here with that. You know, if you're Derek Carr, you're like, I just may have to get out of this AFC real fast because uh you're looking at Allen, Mahomes, Russell Wilson. The AFC is ridiculously stacked. But you can't help but look at it and ask the question, In any way, does it make you jealous that maybe Brad Holmes didn't get one more draft pick for Stafford? And here's why. And here's why it stings me. Maybe not another first, but maybe another second. Because in essence, you should have foreshadowed that the Lions, that the Rams, the Rams season was going to go pretty well. That the pick was going to be somewhere from the 25 to the 30s. So that essentially is a second round pick. Now, I know Brad Holmes trusts his evaluation and he can maybe get good players or package it and move down again and get more picks and all that. There's still unknown regarding those two picks. But the first one is Ifatu Melifanwu, and he was hurt his entire rookie year. You got two more. So you got to be able to hit on these players or otherwise you're going to have a probably decades long uh, bitch fest of, of supporters going, what the hell? How in the hell did you give up Matthew Stafford? Basically, it, it feels like right now that Brad Holmes gave away Stafford when you realize that he goes right away to the Rams and he wins. And he gets them over the hump. And you, in essence, handed the Rams a championship. And that's worth something. And, look, I know that the fans are are all up in Matthew Stafford's business and stuff like that. But for general manager Brad Holmes – Maybe you should have foreshadowed that potentially there would be great success with Stafford and the Rams. Did he, now looking back, based on the Russell Wilson trade, did he fuck up the Stafford trade? I don't think so. I I think here's the thing. I think the Matt Stafford trade set the bar so high for anybody else who had a quarterback who showed that he was competent, right? So, like, there was rumors about Aaron Rodgers possibly getting traded. And I think Aaron Rodgers getting traded 
it was basically starting at three number three num three first round draft picks, and then you were adding seconds and thirds and possibly players. You look at Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson has won championships. Russell Wilson has won playoff games. Russell Wilson has basically carried teams on his back and shown the ability to do so and to be able to produce wins. Matt Stafford was never able to actually carry the team on his back and produce wins. Matt Stafford could give you some big numbers. Matt Stafford could win you a couple of games, but he could never win you a playoff game, could never win a Super Bowl, had to go someplace else and be part of a system to get there. He couldn't ever do it by himself. Russell Wilson has shown the ability to to get these things done. Same thing with, with Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is another guy who has shown that I don't need a whole lot. Just give me give me some talent and let me work. Watch me do things. And I think that's why the price for Russell Wilson was so high. Because he had a history. He had a track record of being able to do big things in big moments when it mattered the most. And you had basically the floor was what Matt Stafford got a year prior. So all that being said, Russell Wilson now comes to the table. I mean, you tell me, do you not think Russell Wilson is basically worth every bit that he got? Oh, because yeah. I think so. I think Denver got the guy that they want. I think like it's Denver, really good. At this point, do you realize what Denver has on offense? Denver's oh. offense is so scary. It's scary. So good. scary. Scary good. It's crazy. That's why they were willing to do it. And credit to George Patton, man. They they were talking. He went out and, and maybe wanted Aaron Rodgers, but to fall back on Russell Wilson, that may yeah. be the best move they could have made. It, it's real. amazing. That's Absolutely. the guy. I mean, and, and that's what these teams are are tasked with trying to find is a quarterback that will get you over the hump. I mean, teams will recycle guys. I mean, look at the lines. They're trying to figure out any which way to make it so that Jared Goff looks like a productive quarterback. So, so, so they're bringing Josh Reynolds back. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't do it for you? Doesn't get you going? <laughs> He's a guy two year contract, two year contract worth up to twelve million dollars. Yeah, it, it's a little high, but he he does something. He, he might make a Monra better, and he is a player that Jared Goff will be ultimately comfortable with. So you have to take that into account. He did make. I think some that's why that impact. was made. Yeah, it made some impact. So I thought that was great. So when you look at the NFL landscape and you say, okay, Aaron Rodgers is back. Jordan Love is fucked. I mean, this is the guy that's like, man, you're gonna, I'm not going to see the field until I'm 27 years old. The guy, I think, maybe the penultimate backup quarterback and just make a living, learn from Aaron Rodgers, and take it and learn as much as you can because when you hit the field, you've shown it that you're not worth the first-round pick. I mean, he just didn't look like a guy that would be next in line, and that's why the Packers gave Aaron Rodgers. Fifty million a season, reportedly, to stay there and, and run it back one or two more years. So now it's the uh, the pressure is on the Packers to handle their business and, and get another ring because when you push like that for Aaron Rodgers and remember now he's not a spring chicken anymore. This is a guy allowed his late thirties that has shown that he hasn't been able to get over the hump now three years in a row. Twenty uh, two thousand nineteen, two thousand twenty. 2021 as the number one seed and you don't leave the NFC and get to the big dance. That's something that's interesting. I'm not too concerned about Rodgers and the Packers, you know, beyond maybe the next year or two, because I think his skills will diminish. And then the eventually the Packers are going to have to pay the Piper, but it's going to be that much harder for the Lions. So they just got to keep building and meet that opportunity that once the Packers run is over, they can take take that step forward. So I, I don't think nobody really projected that Aaron Rodgers was going to leave. So I think that for the for the Lions, prime target number one, get a get an edge rusher that will destroy Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I think Aaron Rodgers coming back to Green Bay, what that does if you're the Detroit Lions and what that tells you is don't go get your quarterback this year. Just wait. You see all these quarterbacks moving all around the league. Everybody's going out and making big moves for quarterbacks. Uh, we talked about Aaron, Aaron Rodgers getting re-signed for a boatload of money. Uh, you talked about Denver going out and trading away everything to get Russell Wilson. Uh, you've got the, the, the Colts trading away uh, Carson Wentz to Washington. 
you've got other teams making moves to position to go get quarterbacks because everybody needs and wants a quarterback. Detroit doesn't need a quarterback right now. Detroit can wait. Focus on building that defense. Look, Aaron Rodgers is going to be there for at least the next year, possibly the next two years. I don't think he sees the end of that contract. It was a four-year extension. I don't think he sees the end of that of that extension. All right, but you've got to deal with Aaron Rodgers in this division now for at least I'm going to say the next two seasons. So build your defense. Go get your edge rusher. Go get your guy who can make his life a living hell so he doesn't eat you up and doesn't pick you apart. I think that is kind of how all of this is shaken out. I think this is the one thing with everything that we have gotten as far as all this movement in the NFL, all these guys that are are getting traded, all these guys and all these teams looking to go grab a new guy. I think what it tells you is if you're Detroit, Focus on what you can take care of right now and build what you can build to make it special. What you can build to make it special is this defense. You've got enough draft capital. Build this defense up. Uh, I think both you and I are in lockstep. If this team can move back at least to four, possibly a little bit further back, move back. This is a really deep draft for for the defense, for guys on defense, for guys who can make an impact and play well. You don't have to go out and you don't have to uh, invest a ton in in a quarterback this year. Don't do it. it. It's it's just, to me, and I think to you as well, it would just be stupid, especially with this quarterback crop that, that that's coming in this year. There's no reason to do it. Go get your DN. Go get your cornerbacks. Grab a wide receiver and really build up what you've got going on so then when you go and you draft that quarterback next year, you can slot them in, and you've got a system that's ready to take off. Now, memo to the Detroit Lions. Whatever you do, put the phone down and do not call for Allen Robinson. Okay? <laughs> Whatever you do, you don't look want, at— You don't want the Detroit local? Can't, no. You don't want that? I, I saw the number that is most important. His separation number is terrible. Mm-hmm. He's 29 years old. The name that I, I know it, it can't be Allen Robinson because they want guys that can separate. The name is Christian Kirk. That's the name. It has to be. I think that once everything shook out and what we're talking about here is what a crazy turn of events that happened just prior to free agency. The Lions are in need of a wide receiver. A report comes out from an established beat writer that says the Lions are going to open their checkbook and potentially pay a top end free agent. And maybe that reverberated around the NFL landscape. And they're like, Detroit wants a wide receiver. Uh, I'll stay with the Chargers. I'll stay with the Packers. I'll stay with the, uh, the team I'm with. Detroit wants, wa- Detroit wants me. Oh, hell no. I'll take a franchise tag. No problem. Uh, Chris Godwin. I'll take a franchise tag. No problem. No problem at all. Uh, all the targets of the Lions got scooped up real quick. And everybody that would have been a cool addition went by the wayside, and I was inevitably dying laughing. And I will say this, don't reach. It's super important that you now understand, yes, you want a wide receiver, but get it through the draft. You can draft two wideouts, and you can draft the position now that you are looking for through the draft. I think get Christian Kirk, keep away from Allen Robinson, and and keep it moving and find your speedy guy. Allen Robinson is not going to be the ex of the future. The dude's 29 years old. And avoid Bobby Wagner because the dude's going to be 32 by the time the season starts. So, look, if the Seattle Seahawks part ways with you, that's not the code to go get him. Yes, he's a productive player, but I know we like to tease free agents at, at, at the podcast and SIO Lions, but that's not realistic. You want to go young, young and speedy and downhill, not a guy looking for a cash grab. And you need a, you would have liked, I would have loved Mike Williams, man. Mike Williams, his size, his big play threat. Maybe you can see about DK Metcalf, but he kind of checks in and out a little bit. The idea is this. The thing that's scary is if they go for the likes of an Amari Cooper, he tends to kind of show up one week and then disappear the next. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, the wide receiver, uh, acquisition through free agency has dried up. So I would just look to the draft, look for the one target that you want being 
that it be Christian Kirk. I think he'd be okay, but he's a little bit undersized, and he has a history of injury, so you don't overspend at the position, in my mind. What did you make of when you saw how all the receivers quickly, it quickly dried up when it was an opportunity for the Lions to give some some people their dollars. They, Nobody wants our dollars. <laughs> it's, it's a wasteland. And they're like, shit, money's money, but I'll take less to be happy. <laughs> I mean, and I would too. If I was a free agent, I would look at that and say, yeah, it's cute. Yeah, it's fun. But if I'm, if, 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 I want to win. Like winning is fun. Yeah, yucking it up with the boys is fun. And having a coach that it, can cut an AEW promo is fun. But winning games is fun. Not getting, not not going through the year with a three win season. That is not fun. So here's the thing. I think the the way this kind of plays out, it could it could benefit the Lions. Michael Gallup was a guy that you were high on up until he got hurt. He's a guy that has been franchise tagged. He's a guy who's available. At least currently, he's available. This might be a guy that the Lions can go and grab on the cheap. I did think it was quite hilarious that basically this was one of the deeper free agency crops uh, for wide receivers. And honestly, we're, we're talking about the likes of uh, a Juju Smith-Schuster, Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, we were talking about an A.J. Green, a Jamison Crowder, an Emmanuel Sanders, a Sammy Watkins, uh, a Zay Jones, an Adam Humphreys. You don't want any of these guys. Like none of these guys do it for you. These are all guys that – you could plug in if you have to, but none of those guys, those aren't guys that you want to go spend money on. You don't want to go cut a check for those guys. But Michael Gallup was a guy that you were, you were massive on. And Michael Gallup has shown at times he can take over a game. And at times he played better than Amari Cooper. Would you be willing to take a possible flyer on a guy coming off of an injury, possibly wanting over $50 million on a new deal? Where, where would you be no. at Michael Gallup? No, no, no. That I, I would be pre-injury. No, that's what scares me because one name in the draft scares me that I don't want to see at 32 that's showing up in a couple of mock drafts. I don't want to see Jamison Williams. I don't want because you know, it just screams Ryan Broyles. It, it works out for other teams. Like other teams get guys that are injured and they have long and prosperous careers and they come to the Lions and they blow out the other knee. They come to the Lions and they end up being TJ Hawkinson where you get nine, ten games out of them, you're very happy, you need them to win, boom, they're done for six games. It's like, come on. I, I need, I need. look, I hate to say it, I hate to be that way, but I need a prime, healthy, young wide receiver that doesn't have a history of injury. Unfortunately, because it stinks, it's kind of like one of those things where you say, hey, their legs, and once the legs go, you just kind of got to mm-hmm. dismiss them. But, hey, quarter uh, running backs and wide receivers, their years are 22 to 30. Yeah. And 20, sometimes it's 22 to 29. And once their wheels go, I don't want to risk it in any way, shape, or form. The Lions have to be risk averse. They're not in a position to take chances. You can't have luxury picks. You need a guy to come in, stay healthy, run routes, and be able to take a top off a of defense. And so I think they'll do that. The X is coming in the draft. Free agency, hit on defense, hit on a backup quarterback, and maybe this is all a smokescreen. Because there's no wide receiver right now that's available that makes me maybe Christian Kirk, like I said, that makes me say, okay, I, I, I'd be super thrilled if they came to Detroit. Uh, so it's Christian not, Kirk and Michael Gallup are, are my two guys. I would take a yeah, flyer yeah. on Michael Gallup. It's an ACL. Yeah. Guys yeah. come back from ACLs and generally, once it gets fixed, yeah. it's stronger than it was before. I get what you're saying, but for me, those are the two guys that are still left out there that you could go grab, bring in, and I think would make an immediate impact on this offense. Nice, nice stuff, man. And as we progress weekly, we will start looking at mock drafts. We'll start looking at all the rumors, all the speculation, all the players that potentially could suit up for the Detroit Lions. And maybe, just maybe, Adam and I will finally get our wish because the last couple games, the Florida stretch that the Red Wings had, leads everybody to believe that Jeff Blaschel has to be on his way out. There's nothing that indicates that this guy can maintain his job. The look that Steve Eiserman gave after giving up that many goals at home earlier this week, and Jeff Blaschel's making it a habit of playing Grice, pulling Grice, and uh, putting in the backup, and then putting in the starter again. That's now twice he's done that. And I've never seen that before in my in, in, in my life, where the starter is in the game, 
gives up multiple goals, gets pulled, and then uh, the, the guy that comes in cold, the backup, gives up goals and then gets pulled too, and the starter gets originally put back in the game. Now, that's not the way you want to operate your your hockey club. So pour one out for Danny DeKaiser. Wednesday got waived, put on IR. It was a slow decline, and it's unfortunate for the hometown guy. But the Wings kind of on a downslide when it was an opportunity to make the postseason. So Jeff has to go, and that's the uh, rant for me this week, and I know you probably feel the exact same way. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what Steve Eisman does with Jeff Blaschel. Uh, here's the thing. I think at, at certain points in the season, we've been impressed by what Blaschel has been able to get out of some of this young talent. But then you go and you have games where you just totally get flexed by by Phoenix, and Phoenix isn't a very good team. So it, it leaves you kind of scratching your head, like, which is it? Because it's just way too bipolar. Is is he the coach who can get a, a ton out of some young talent and really put these guys in position to allow them to grow? Or is he more in line with the guy who can't get his club ready if these guys show up flat and they just get – the doors blown off like like which is it and i think it's just been a little bit too inconsistent with with a lot of that this season so i think steve eisman's next move is going to be interesting and i don't know if jeff blashell gets another season i'm not sure if Uh, if steve eisman's on board with with what is taking place because i don't know if he's seeing what he wants to see yeah, no, I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing what I want to see. I'm not seeing uh, mm-hmm. uh, progression. I'm not seeing uh, getting better steadily. I'm seeing after the break, I don't know, maybe just Blashell's kind of like one of those guys that is good, basically okay with the scheme, but just rubs people the wrong way with his constant delivery, to game in, game out. you got to be part psychologist in order to – be successful and to get out of here before we all head back to margaritaville Jawan mm-hmm. howard credit to him for going to therapy to work out his issues he had his first presser and he told everybody that he had to work through some issues and he got therapy and he's apologetic michigan michigan state are headed to the big 10 tournament how It'll much of program. that are you buying all of it, yeah. He needs therapy. He needs therapy. No, I'm sure he needs therapy, but how much of that are you actually buying, though? Because like I seen that and I was like, okay, and I, was, <laughs> I just kept it moving. I like I didn't like. I was like no. You you didn't validate that? No. <laughs> no. Like the, the the best part was what the newspapers were putting out. He's extremely remorseful. Yeah. He takes full credit and and owns what he messed up on and and says that it's all his fault. Well. Yeah, like, let's go back and watch the tape. Like, the tape tells you that you were a boner. <laughs> like, you can't just go around pimp smacking assistant coaches. I don't care what happens. Like, you got in that line looking for a fight, and then you tried to revoke a fight. Like, yeah. what? No. All right. All right. Uh, I'm headed to Margaritaville, baby. It's going to be a fun <laughs> night. I think Michigan probably outlasts Michigan State by a round. I don't, I don't see them getting to Sunday. I think Michigan maybe gets to the semis if they can make a run and handle business. But Phil Marcelli deserves ultimate credit. Kudos, sure uh, does. developed and did his thing. And you might, you might have a point guard, you know, that, that, that might actually, uh, shine in, in doing his job finally. Uh, at Michigan, which was nice to see, especially when you need a win against Ohio State and somebody that had been relatively dormant comes in and handles his business. So make sure everybody to follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Make sure if you agree or disagree with anything that you've heard on this podcast, hit us up. Let us know if you like us, don't like us, like the sound, don't like the sound. I appreciate having the banter with everybody. Podcasting time has come to a close. Make sure you subscribe anywhere that you find and listen to your favorite podcast. Remember, we started this thing back, Adam and I, back in 2013. And now everybody from the biggest of companies to the lowest of the the people starting their new podcast this week, everybody's podcasting, even the guy that could go number two to the Lions will start a podcast. And boy, when I see that, it just warms me up. Aiden Hutchinson will start a podcast. Point for him. It's the greatest form of broadcasting that you can do. It's ultimately freeing. You can say and do whatever you want. Right now, 
I'm watching a wrestling match, enjoying the company of my cousin, telling jokes, telling bad jokes, texting friends, and looking at how many people are on DetroitSportsPodcast.com. Where else can you have this much fun and freedom than in the platform of podcasting? If you if you don't absorb anything from the hour you just spent listening to this, start a podcast. It's really ultimately freeing. It's an expression. It's an outlet. And Adam and I would normally just be drinking beers and wasting money. Instead, we get to shoot the shit for an hour a week. And that's all been possible thanks to you guys in Detroit. And I'm forever, Adam and I are forever grateful. Thanks, cuz. Let's get after it next week. Let's get to Margaritaville, baby. Let's get, uh, let's get after it. Let's watch some wrestling. Have a good time. And let's see about these Detroit Lions. Peace, brother. <laughs>